This is episode one of Revelation and Introduction. And I draw a lot on two main sources, the book by J.A. Seif titled The Apocalypse and lectures by Dr. Chuck Missler, he's a Bible teacher, plus some Google images that are copied for illustration purposes, as you can see here. The word apocrypha from the Greek to hide away means in biblical lit literature, those works outside the accepted canon of scripture, those works that are concealed, a mystery not revealed. The word apocalypse, on the other hand, implies the revealing of an event involving massive destruction on a catastrophic scale. Revelation is an end of the world scenario of judgment day on the unrighteous. Revelation describes a coming apocalypse, a future time, revealed in awesome minute detail about the events surrounding the rapture and then later the second coming of Christ. After the rapture follows this awful day of the Lord, a fearful time. Isaiah, who lived nearly 2,800 years ago, described this coming event, this day of the Lord, as a time when people will conceal themselves behind rocks and in caves and dig holes in the ground to hide for the fear of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. Isaiah 2 says, Go into the rocks, hide in the ground from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. The eyes of the arrogant will be humbled and human pride brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Revelation reveals that just as over 2,000 years ago we saw Christ ascending into heaven, so we will see Christ descending from heaven in his own person, in his office as king of kings, accompanied by his host of angels and his entire administration to rule and judge this earthly kingdom. Revelation is all about Jesus and only Jesus. It's God's plan being fulfilled for his beloved son. God exalts Jesus above all things. He places all things under Jesus' feet. Psalm 8 proclaims, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The angel had promised Mary that her son would sit on the throne of David. And when Jesus comes again, he will be fulfilling this promise. Isaiah 11 describes that for Jesus, a stump of Jesse, the spirit of the Lord Yahweh will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel, of might, of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Revelation 21 describes the second coming. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Zealand, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. With the rapture, the bride is the church, and her husband is Christ. The book of Revelation reveals that when Jesus comes again, he will be clothed in splendor and glory. He will be absolutely worthy of honor. We learn that Satan will be interned in hell, sin will be abolished, we will have a new heaven and a magnificent new earth, and we will live in peace on earth. But then after a thousand years of peace, Satan will be released again for a short season to tempt mankind one last time. Then Satan, his fallen angels and demons, and the unrighteous will be bound forever in hell and its lake of fire. And the righteous will spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. What a wonderful blessing. Jesus says the book of Revelation is a blessing. It's the only book in the Bible that says anyone who reads or hears this book will be blessed. Revelation 1.3 says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So here's some metrics, Old Testament. 13 of 39 Old Testament books give prominence to the second coming. That's a lot of books. And 1,845 references to Christ's rule on earth. In the New Testament, we have 23 of the 27 books mention the second coming. And of 216 chapters, 318 references of the second coming. So we have over 2,000 between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have over 2,000 references to Christ's rule on earth. And for every prophecy relating to his first coming, there are eight treating his second coming. 
So now we move to John the disciple. John was the person who wrote this book of Revelation. And Revelation was given to John as he sat confined on the island of Patmos, a tiny little island about 25 miles west of the coast of Turkey, which is here in the Aegean Sea. And this is Greece, and here's Turkey. John was imprisoned by the then Roman Emperor Domitian, and when that emperor died, John was released from Patmos. He returned to Ephesus, where he eventually died a natural death at 104 years old. So here's Patmos, and here's Ephesus. It's a harbor city, or it was in those days. John was completely devoted to Jesus. The Bible says he was the favorite of Jesus, the beloved disciple. John leaned on Jesus' shoulder at the Last Supper. John writes, Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, who had also leaned on his breast at supper. John and James were brothers, the sons of Zebedee, a fisherman, and Jesus called them the sons of thunder. You don't get a name like that for nothing. They were aggressive and did not back away from confrontation. They tended to be insensitive when speaking their minds. They didn't have a lot of filters. When Jesus was telling them of his impending death, they blurted out. They said to him, grant, that, grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. That's like saying to someone who's just found out they have a few weeks to live, Bummer, you're going to die? Can I have your car? The three of them, Peter, John, and James, were part of Jesus' inner circle and were with Jesus on three intensely private occasions. They were on the Mount of Transfiguration when Christ met with Moses and Elijah, and Jesus was transfigured as his face and clothes became dazzlingly bright. They were present at the raising of the dead daughter of Jairus, a synagogue leader, and they were at Gethsemane. All 12 disciples were at Gethsemane, but these three were closer to Jesus than the others. John was also at the foot of the cross with Mary, and Jesus gave guardianship of his mother to John. In fact, they say John was the only disciple at the foot of the cross with Mary. Jesus didn't give Mary to any of his brothers or sisters, he gave his mother to John to look after. So John was very special to Jesus. John wrote five books in the New Testament, and Second John is regarded by some as a private letter to Mary. In the letter, John is warning to the lady chosen by God to be careful of many deceivers trying to take advantage of her. He warns her to watch out and don't take people into her house and welcome them. So John was always thinking of Mary, of her protection and well-being. When John was visited in his cave on Patmos by the angel, he writes four times, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, given to the thr taken to the throne of heaven. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. He was carried away in the wilderness. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. He was carried to a mountain. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. The divine outline of this entire book of Revelation is given in just this one verse, Revelation 119. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. So what you have seen is the vision of Christ in the cave, which is the past. What is now is the existing seven churches at the time, which was the present. And what will take place later, which is what follows after the church is raptured, which is the future. And in Revelation, we've got lots of sevens. Numbers tell a story. From the first sentence of the Bible in Genesis to the last book of Revelation of Jesus Christ, God is telling one story. He uses numbers and words to convey his message. The number seven is the most prominent number throughout the whole Bible. The word seven or derivatives such as seventh or seventy, etc., appears in the Bible 562 times. The book of the Bible that uses the word seven most frequently is Revelation, where it appears 55 times. The number seven is used so frequently because it carries meaning beyond just the numerical value itself. 
The number seven, when used in scripture, and especially when used in conjunction with God, often carries with it the meaning of completeness or wholeness. Or we may see a single complete event as a series of seven things, performed as seven separate stages. And the final seventh thing is often special in some way, different from the first six. For example, creation is one whole event that was revealed in scripture as seven days. In creation, God worked the first six days, but he rested on the seventh day and declared that day to be holy. In several cases, we can see the special seventh aspect in Revelation, and we're going to go through them. There's a number of them. Now that we understand the meaning and impact of God's message in the number seven, let us look at it in Scripture, in Revelation Scripture. According to Dr. Chuck Missler, there are a number of sevens in Revelation, and you can check them all in these chapters here. There are seven churches, lampstands, stars, and spirits. Seven promises to overcomers, lamps, horns of the lamps, eyes of the lamps, seals on a scroll. Seven trumpets, angels, thunders, heads of dragons, seven crowns, bowls, plagues, mountains, and kings. And God uses sevens throughout nature, including in our own spinal column, there's seven. So God is uh, very consistent. When he has, finds a good thing, he uses it. Uh, so here's just some illustrations. So the le seven lampstands are the seven churches that Jesus reveals to John on Patmos. And they are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. They're here in Western Turkey. And we're going to go through each of those churches. Then the lampstand with seven lamps. So this whole thing is the lampstand. And these little cups up here that hold the flame, those are what's called the lamps. So Jesus, there's another scripture in Revelation of Jesus with the seven stars, which are the pastors in his hands, and the seven lampstands, which are the churches in, in um, Turkey, these seven churches at the time. There's, you get the seven mountains of Revelation. So some people believe the seven mountains are the physical mountains mentioned in the Bible which are the Mount Ararat, Mount Sinai, Mount of Olives, Mount Zion, Mount of Transfiguration, Mount Carmel, and Sermon on the Mount. But I believe the seven mountains are not the actual physical mountains mentioned in the Bible, but are the seven mountains of influence as explained by Lance Wellnow, a Christian author. Once Satan took control of these seven mountains, he had taken major control of man and his destiny. Today, Christians are fighting Satan in order to regain control of earth by reclaiming the seven mountains of influence. So these are them. And in business today, very few Christians, we know from big pharma, big tech, big uh, corporations, Walmart, etc., that there's not a lot of CEOs that are Christians. We know in government, for sure, there are very few Christians. They convinced Christians that there should be a separation between church and state, and like idiots, Christians got out, and the, the unrighteous got in, as we can see today. Uh, the family, the biological man and the biological woman giving birth to biological children, the family is the bedrock of society. It's the bedrock of a stable neighborhood, of a stable community, of stable counties, stable cities, stable states, and an ultimately stable country. So the family is the bedrock of stability, and therefore the the ungodly are trying very hard to break down the family entity, family unit. Religion today, um, a lot of the mega pastors give out motivational speeches and feel-good speeches, uh, but they don't really reference the, the Bible or give any scripture to back up what they're saying. They just want to make you feel good. So Christians have lost even control of religion. The media today in America is owned by six companies. That's all, six corporations. They own all the TVs, all the radio, all the print, all the magazines, all the newspapers. And so whenever they have a message they want to give out, whether we, you know, whatever the message is, they're, every part of media, including social media, is in lockstep and they give the same message all the time. doesn't matter whether you go from Facebook to TV, you're getting the same message pumped at you all the time. It's uh, propaganda. And so Christians need to get back into media and start taking over media. And this, this, this presentation I'm doing on Revelation is one tiny way of doing it. Education, Christians need to definitely get back into education. We know the state of the education in America today. 
Um, we need to get back into the school boards, into the teachers' union, into the board of education. All of them, they determine the, the curriculum that our children will learn, and we need to get Christians back in there so that education is focused on reading, writing, and arithmetic, and not on everything, everything else. Entertainment, this is a biggie, because whenever these six here, these six mountains of influence want to blind you to what they're actually doing compared to what you know you hope they're doing or you elected them to do they hit you with entertainment big sports big golf tournaments tennis tournaments uh, football uh, gymnastics ice skating anything to distract you from what's going on in these other six and so we need to get uh, back or just ignore i mean they haven't started throwing christians to the lions yet but we definitely need to get back into entertainment and control some of it so that the message that's coming out is godly. So today, let me repeat it, Christians are fighting Satan in order to regain control of earth by regaining these seven mountains of influence. So let's do some happier ones. There's seven Beatitudes. There's blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed of those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. In that chapter 14, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. 16, blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed. Jesus comes as a thief in the night and you don't want to be caught unawares. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. And blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in the scroll. And blessed are those who wash their robes. And there's seven worships. You can check them in the chapters here. Holy, holy, holy. Of course, they always have three. Holy, holy, holy. Or Jesus used to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's a uh, holy, holy, holy is uh, the Trinity. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Worthy art thou unto him that sits on the throne. Salvation to our God. We give thanks, great and marvelous, and four hallelujahs. And there's some subtle sevens. There's seven personages, a woman, a man-child, red dragon, seven-headed beast, false prophet, Michael, and the lamb. There are seven years of judgment. There are seven I am's of Christ. And there are many other more sevens if you want to search for them. So this is the end of episode one, an introduction to Revelation. I hope you enjoyed it. Please follow me on to episode two. Thank you.